to increase awareness and knowledge about endometriosis, um, including the symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment options. We want to provide accurate and up-to-date information about endometriosis to help reduce misconceptions and stigma surrounding this condition. And we really want to encourage early diagnosis and treatment for endometriosis by really highlighting the importance of recognizing symptoms and seeking medical attention. All right, so what is endometriosis? So endometriosis is a very common condition. It's when cells that should only grow in the uterine lining start growing outside of the uterine lining, all right? So uterine lining is what sheds every month when you have a period. That's the, the blood that comes out. It's really the shedding of the uterine lining cells. So when that similar tissue grows outside of the uterus, um, that's called endometriosis. In women with pain, infertility, or both, the frequency is an, of endometriosis is up to 50%. And really it's probably more than that, right? And we'll go into it in later slides, but a lot of endometriosis goes undiagnosed. But diagnosis is you know, at least 50%. If you have somebody with pain and or infertility, you're gonna have endometriosis at least half the time. Endometrial cells can instead of growing completely outside of the uterus, can grow into the uterine muscle where they also should not be. And that's called adenomyosis. It's sort of like a subset or variation of endometriosis. Um, and then again, these abnormal cells can grow outside of the uterus and implant anywhere in the pelvis. So here's your pelvis here. This is kind of cut if you cut somebody in half and look at it sideways. So this is the butt, this is the abdomen, right? This is the leg here and you have the uterus here, you have the bladder and you have the rectum. So all these structures are close to each other and endometriosis can really grow anywhere. It can also grow in the upper abdomen and actually even outside of the abdominal cavity on the chest, but that's more rare. More, most commonly we see endometriosis kind of, kind of in this bottom area and that's why patients with endometriosis have pelvic pain because that's where it's located. Endometriosis is estrogen dependent condition. What does that mean? Is you need to have estrogen in order to have endometriosis. So you're not gonna see you know, a five-year-old with endometriosis. You're not gonna see an 85-year-old with endometriosis, right? It's a, usually a disease of in, in people of reproductive age, right? Uh, now you can have somebody who's very young, who's for example, 14 years old, right? But they have to have already been having periods um, and have, hormone production to have endometriosis. This is what endometriosis looks like in real life. So it's this, these are the abnormal cells that have implanted outside of the uterus in the pelvis, and they can look like this black sort of patch, um, but they can look very different. It can be more clear, more you know brown than, than gray or black. So that's why it's important to have a, a specialist treat this condition. Now, symptoms of endometriosis, classic symptom is painful periods, right? So because again, it's a um, hormone dependent tissue, typically the symptoms are related to your menstrual cycle. So if someone says, I have pain, that's completely random. Um, it's, I'm not gonna say hundred percent, it's not possible to have endometriosis, but it's gonna be less likely endometriosis if the pain doesn't have any type of pattern to it. So typically pelvic pain that's cyclical in nature, that's around the menstrual period is more suspicious for endometriosis. It can start before the period starts and it sort of gets worse during the period and then gets better after the period. Or it could be most of the month, but get worse around the period. That's typically endometriosis. Heavy bleeding can be a sign of endometriosis. Infertility, as I mentioned before, can be a sign of endometriosis. And a lot of patients who have what's called undiagnosed uh, or unexplained infertility. So let's say you have someone who has been trying to conceive, they go to a fertility doctor, they have all the blood work, they do the semen analysis to rule out male factor infertility um, and nothing, everything looks normal, right? So it's unexplained. We don't know why you can't get pregnant, but we're going to you know, do um, try to do fertility treatments to help you get pregnant. A lot of these patients actually have endometriosis. 
IBS-like symptoms. So this is extremely common. I would say probably over 90% of my patients with endometriosis, when they come to me for a consultation, one of the symptoms they mention is IBS, okay? So IBS is a clinical diagnosis. Um, so there's no, you know, gastroenterologist essentially does all these tests to rule out other conditions. And then when they can't find anything, they tell you, okay, you probably have IBS. So it's just a, you know, there's some inflammation in the bowel that can cause, you know, constipation or diarrhea or both um, or bloating. Okay. But endometriosis causes inflammation. And because, as I showed in the previous slides here, this is your bowel. This is your rectum here and large intestine. This is also a portion of the large intestine. And then there's a bunch of small intestines here too that are not depicted on the picture. Because the bowels are right there in the pelvis and your large intestines right there in the pelvis next to the uterus, inflammation from the endometriosis can cause IBS type symptoms, right? So it can cause bloating. It can cause constipation. Um, another common symptom is pain with bowel movements during periods. Um, pain with sex is another common symptom. And again, it's all based on the anatomy where you have, you know, the top of the vagina is right there in contact with the internal structures. Um, so if you have endometriosis, they can cause painful intercourse. Um, another symptom that's not on here is painful uh, urination, right? So, or pain with urination during periods or maybe frequent urination because the bladder um, can be also inflamed from endometriosis. But even though we have all these symptoms pointing to endometriosis, right? Or all these symptoms that make us suspect endometriosis, it still takes 12 years or can take to average of 12 years for someone to get actually correct diagnosis. And to me, that is just nuts, right? I mean, we have, here we have a well-known condition. We have all these lists of symptoms that are, you know, pretty specific, I would say. And still, you know, a patient will go to multiple specialists, you know, complaining of all these symptoms and they get passed around, right? So they go to the gynecologist, the gynecologist sends them to the gastroenterologist. Then they go to the urologist and then they just keep going around in a circle. Um, meanwhile, they visit ERs, which, you know, drives up the medical costs. Um, they get multiple imaging, right? Because typically every time you go to the ER, the emergency department with abdominal pain, if it's, you know, bad enough, they're going to get a CAT scan, right? Um, and then you're going to get a pelvic ultrasound. So all of these things drive up cost. Then you, you know, you're probably going to get pain medications. And then there's the issue of chronic pain medication use um, and all these things. So you're just kind of go down the rabbit hole hole. Um, when in fact, you know, someone should have said, okay, you probably have endometriosis and we need to treat it, right? But unfortunately, that's not the case. And again, I see patients all the time. I mean, there's, I, I don't think I've ever seen a patient who told me, oh, I just started having these symptoms a month ago and, you know, here I am and what should I do? No, it's always been, I've had this for 10 years and no one's really done anything about it. Also important to understand that endometriosis doesn't have to exist by itself, right? So if you have pain and if you have all the symptoms and somebody did, let's say you went to the ER and you had a CAT scan and you had a pelvic ultrasound and they told you, oh, you have fibroids. Doesn't mean that you can't have endometriosis. You can have both. And what we found actually, we, we did um, a study where we looked at the patients who were undergoing, in our practice, who were undergoing fibroid removal surgery. And in those patients, almost 50% were found to have endometriosis. And again, it might be even higher than that. In literature, that's quoted to be between 12 and 26%, but it's actually much higher. It's just that when fibroid surgery is done, a lot of times the doctors, either because of the method they're using or because they're just not looking for it, they're not looking for endometriosis. So it might be there, but no one's sort of looking, all right? So both fibroids and endometriosis are very common and they can coexist. So just because you have fibroids doesn't all of a sudden rule out endometriosis and here you found your uh, you know, reason for pain. 
endometriosis can vary in stages or severity, right? Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because it's going to affect your treatment and it's going to affect your fertility, right? Someone who has minimal or stage one endometriosis have much different prognosis in terms of fertility. Um, and it's going to be much easier to treat than someone who has stage four endometriosis. Now, it doesn't mean that stage one endometriosis patients will definitely have less pain. No. But in terms of treatment method, it's much easier to treat stage one than stage four. And it's much easier for a stage one endometriosis patient to get pregnant than stage four. So most stage four endometriosis patients will absolutely require fertility treatments to conceive. Um, and you know a lot of them will not get pregnant uh, because of the effect that the endometriosis has on the ovaries, on the eggs, right? So, and even within stage four, within the severe stage, there's also gonna be variation. So, you know, some, some stage fours are sort of worse than others, right? Uh, and that's why diagnosis is so important because you really have no way to diagnose this, and we'll, we'll talk about this shortly, without doing surgery. Now, this is stage four versus normal. So this is normal anatomy. So you, this is sort of, you're only seeing one half. So this is the right side of the patient. This is the uterus, um, and this is a picture taken with laparoscopy. Uh, so this is not imaging. This is actually a picture taken during surgery. So you have the uterus, you have the fallopian tube on the right side. This is the right ovary. Um, this is, you see like a portion of the intestine here. Um, this is behind the uterus. So this is your rectum, right? So most of the time we find endometriosis in this area. And in mild cases, it'll just be like little sprinkles of little pepper spots of endometriosis. Now, this is stage four endometriosis. So you still have your uterus, the ovary, and the tube, and then you have your bowel and the rectum here. But look how terrible this looks, all right? I mean, this looks like some type of abstract painting of, of this, right? And this just looks terrible and ugly. Um, this fallopian tube, rather than being thin and just hanging down all the way down, it's thick, and then it's wrapping around the ovary here and it's actually stuck over here. See how this ovary and the uterus, they're not even touching. Look at all the space in between versus this is just stuck. This is all inflammation. This is what's causing the pain, the chronic pain. And even if, let's say by a magic wand, I can make this patient go into menopause tomorrow and all the hormones stop being produced, the scar tissue will stay here forever. All right, so this is a result of chronic inflammation that leads to all this scarring and everything being stuck. So this patient may have pain, even though she's not having any more periods, right? Or if we put give her medicine, right, that stops her periods, this patient will still have pain because of all this looking like it does. Am I good, Beza? You you jumped into the video oh this. yes your audio just sometimes goes a little bit out so you might want to oh. get closer yeah you're good okay yes. okay <laughs> all right now causes so a lot of patients always ask well what's what causes endometriosis because you know as a patient you're always trying to think well how can i prevent it right so if i know the cause I, i'll know how to not have it it's unfortunately not clear exactly what causes it, right? So it, is it you know, genetic, right? So we know endometriosis is extremely common. Um, certainly you can have multiple family members within the family have endometriosis. How do those abnormal cells get there? One theory, which has been sort of around for a really long time is what's called retrograde menstruation. So the cells from the inside the uterus somehow migrate through the fallopian tubes and implant. That's probably not you know, accurate because we know that patients without uh, a uterus, like if they had the uterus removed, can still have endometriosis that grows. Um, and also we know that those, it's not just a matter of like, if I went and I took some cells from uterine lining, 
and then I threw them down in the pelvis, they're probably not going to survive because those cells are only meant to grow inside the uterus. So there's some type of mutation that's happened in those cells to be able to grow outside of the uterus. Could it be hormone or environmental factors, problems with the immune system? Maybe, we don't know, all right? We know that there's risk factors. So we know that adenomyosis, which is endometriosis of the uterus, when you have these abnormal cells growing in the muscle of the uterus, it's more common in women who've had multiple C-sections. Okay, so that's that's a fact. Um, but we sometimes see it in someone who's very young and has never even gotten pregnant. Um, we know that endometriosis can grow in the C-section scar. Um, so someone who's had a previous C-section, endometriosis can actually grow in the skin, in the scar of the skin, right underneath the skin and grow through the muscle. So that's, you know, we see that sometimes. So we, but we don't know why it gets there and why it all of a sudden starts to grow in some patients. I mean, then you would think that every single patient with endometriosis had it and they, some, most patients don't. So we don't know, all right? Now, best way to diagnose it, I mentioned surgery. So a laparoscopy, it's not, all, all, it's not really the best way to diagnose it. It really should be say the only way. So you cannot, you can have a suspicion, right? So if you come to me and you say, I have pain with my menstrual cycles, I have pain with sex, um, you know, I have infertility, um, and it doesn't have to be all of these symptoms, right? But I say, okay, you probably have endometriosis, but I don't have the diagnosis yet. So the only way to, to look and see if you have it is by doing a laparoscopy, right? We actually put the camera, look inside, and now we can see if, is there endometriosis or not. Now, when you go to your either primary care or your OBGYN, they may suggest you know, preliminary tests. They may do a pelvic exam or an ultrasound or an MRI. And it's important to know that what these tests are looking for is we're trying to find any other condition that can be there. So fibroids, ovariances, and still it doesn't rule out endometriosis. We're just looking for other things that we can diagnose by imaging, all right? So these tests are really there to rule out other things. If a, if a patient comes to me with symptoms that are suggestive of endometriosis and they don't have a recent ultrasound, I, I have them do an ultrasound only again, to make sure that we're not dealing with something else in addition to the suspected endometriosis. But ultimately what we're gonna do for this patient is to do the laparoscopy. I just want to know by doing an ultrasound whether the patient has something else going on that we would need to take care of surgically, right? So if she happens to also have fibroids and I'm already doing surgery for endometriosis, well, we should probably address the fibroids at the same time. Um, so, but it does not, normal ultrasound or normal CAT scan or an MRI does not rule out um, endometriosis. Pelvic exams are very limited, all right? Patients come in all shapes and sizes. And a pelvic exam, I mean, maybe if you're 100 pounds, you're going to be able to feel something that's there to feel, but a tiny little endometriosis implant that cannot be seen on imaging, you're not going to feel on pelvic exam, all right? Also, because pelvic exams are done on patients who are awake, um, all, you know, the discomfort of the pelvic exam makes people very tense and again, makes it much more difficult to feel. And really a pelvic exam is not going what we call change our management. So if you have a perfectly normal pelvic exam, and let's say I'm the best pelvic examiner in the world, I can feel things that no one else can feel. And I, and the pelvic exam is normal. I don't feel anything. I tell you it's perfect. Everything's normal. Does that mean you don't have endometriosis? And does that mean you don't need surgery? No. So pelvic exams are completely useless, especially when you have, you know, imaging. So if the imaging doesn't see anything, really a pelvic exam is not going to show you anything different. And the next step, if you're suspecting endometriosis, is going to be laparoscopy. Now, 
patients typically ask, what is the best surgical way to treat endometriosis? What do you do? So you go in for surgery, you see endometriosis, what now? What do you do with it, right? So we recommend excision. So excision means you're cutting it out. Ablation means you're burning it, all right? So ablation, the problem with ablation, you know, as you see here, so there's a picture, you have non-excision flamethrower, right? So you're burning the endometriosis, which here's the flower, and you leave the root, right? So because sometimes you can have endometriosis, we call them implants, little growths of endometriosis, it grows deep into the tissue. If you just burn it, um, you're very likely not removing or destroying the full thickness of it. If you cut it out, you're more effectively removing all the abnormal tissue. Also, because endometriosis, as I mentioned, grows around other structures, your bladder, your bowel, you really don't want to be burning right on top of these structures because you're, you're going to destroy uh, or damage or injure normal tissue like bladder or bowel. So well, in those areas, you really cannot, you don't have an option. You cannot burn. You either leave it or you have to cut it out. All right. So and this is another reason why you need a specialist, right? Not only to make the correct diagnosis, but also to effectively do the surgery. Non-surgical treatment. So I, it's not so much treating the endometriosis. It's more like treating the symptoms, right? So it's very important. Birth control pills, IUDs, patches, all hormonal methods. They're commonly used to control the symptoms of mild to moderate endometriosis. So if we have someone who, let's say we diagnosed this person with endometriosis, we did the laparoscopy, we made the diagnosis, we removed the endometriosis, we typically recommend um, to be on some type of hormonal management to manage some of the, the symptoms. Does it mean that the endometriosis will never come back? No, it doesn't, all right? And the time, which is another common question, how long does it take to, um, for the endometriosis to come back, it varies, right? Because we don't, we can't diagnose it by ultrasound, we can't accurately know the instance that it comes back. We always go by symptoms. Um, and most of the time symptoms are reliable, uh, but sometimes, you know, let's say someone has starts having symptoms again six months later and they want to do another surgery, um, we do another laparoscopy. And sometimes we find very minimal um, endometriosis, much less than what we found originally, right? But it can be there already in six months. But typically we prefer once we've made the diagnosis and once we know that it's mild and not severe, we typically like to manage the symptoms now with these medications. Now, anti-hormone medications like Lupron or Alyssa, my Fembri, so these are all um, hormone blockers, right? They're anti-hormones. So these are used for either severe endometriosis, moderate to severe endometriosis, or someone who continues to have symptoms despite having had surgery and who've tried you know, the, the hormonal methods and they're just not as effective. Um, so instead of keep bringing them back for surgery after surgery after surgery, especially if they're not really seeing significant relief, then we may put them on these medications. The trouble with these medications is that you really can't stay on them indefinitely. So typically we do like a short um, period of time, three to six months, really depends on individual patient, what their fertility fertility plans, the needs are. Um, so again, it, it, but it's once you've established a diagnosis, you would not start the patient on these medications without even knowing that they have endometriosis. Uh, why CIGC, what is CIGC's approach to treatment? Um, we use the dual port approach. So we use two small incisions, okay? So instead of having multiple incisions, we use one incision at the belly button, that's this one, and the camera is inserted through the port. It's only five millimeters, very small. And then another incision in the suprapubic and the bikini line, same size. Um, so most of the endometriosis surgeries are done only through two incisions, and that gives you fast recovery. It's fewer incisions and smaller incisions than robotic surgery, but inside we can accomplish the same thing. 
there's no hospital stay. This is completely outpatient. We do these in outpatient facilities. Um, and, you know, the patients get much more personalized and better quality care uh, than in the hospital. Uh, and then typically we continue follow-up, of course, every typically every three to six months, um, depending again on the level of endometriosis and what the symptoms are and how much relief the patient gets. And then fertility assessment and counseling, of course, um, and dietary changes. Hi, Dr. D. Can we yeah. take a Hi. picture there and maybe address yeah. a few of the yeah. questions that popped in? Um, would you like Sounds to good. read them or you Yeah, yeah, I'll just issue. read through them. Right. Yeah. Okay. Start with Jennifer, I G Jennifer. Jennifer. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So when my menstruation started at nine years old, I had a painful period. I was not treated for endometriosis until 12, 13 years old due to genetic history. Dr. D did my first surgery at 20 years old with stage four. I've not had surgery since, but I've used holistic Chinese medicine in combination with my GYN treatment. I have adenomyosis. Recently, I tried an IUD, but the clots um, swifted the device. Um, is surgery the next suggestion because I'm nervous about additional scar tissue, especially because I haven't had children yet? Yeah. So, I mean, stage four is right the most advanced endometriosis. So, so it's tough. Stage four endometriosis is always difficult to treat, um, especially in someone who wants fertility. So essentially, you know, it's just think of it as undiagnosed, uncontrolled diabetes, and you can't, you're not able to find a medication that works. You know, it's 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 a extremely frustrating, right, for the patient. Um, and, and for the provider because they want to help the patient. So with stage four endometriosis, it's very important to understand that fertility is very low, right? So early on, you always want to think about fertility preservation, meaning egg freezing, because endometriosis, it's like bad, you know, disease, just trying to infect everything, okay, a bad bug. And things that it, it affects is the ovaries. Ovaries have eggs. Um, we're born with eggs, we don't make them. Men make you know the new sperm all the time. Women, no, we're just the eggs. And then as you age, the egg count goes down and the egg quality goes down. And then endometriosis patients, you can have somebody who's 30 years old who you would think, oh my God, they should get pregnant like that. Um, who really cannot get pregnant because their eggs have been damaged, um, destroyed by endometriosis, and there's no way for them to make new eggs, right? So they have a very, what's we call poor ovarian reserve. In that case, the only way to get pregnant would be through um, through fertility, through egg donate, egg, using an egg donor, okay? Um, so that's the ovaries. The tubes in stage four endometriosis are almost always blocked or they have endometriosis in the fallopian tubes. So again, they're not usable. The uterus, okay, when it has adenomyosis, that means you have endometriosis in the muscle of the uterus. So everything, all the tissues have been infected by endometriosis, right? Invaded by endometriosis. Oh. With adenomyosis, depending on, on how extensive it is, right? So you have this uterus, which is like a house that holds the pregnancy. If majority of this house has been invaded by endometriosis, then most likely the pregnancy is not going to happen. And the rate of early miscarriage, like a first trimester miscarriage is very high. So that's, that's the issue with fertility. Um, so really it depends on what's going on and is the surgery, can we do something with surgery to improve things? If there is a big cyst, endometriosis cyst on the ovary, then with surgically we can remove it to try to um, make it more beneficial, you know, for the rest of the ovary to at least to function and for some eggs to survive rather than let this endometriosis cyst continue to destroy things. So, but surgery is going to be limited um, in someone who wants to get pregnant uh, unless there's something for us there, you know, to take out. Because again, we can't take out the uterus, we can't take out the, the ovaries, right? And somebody who's trying to get pregnant, 
and endometriosis is already there in those structures. So going in and just plucking some tissue here, some tissue there, while leaving the rest of the endometriosis there may not be beneficial and could just, as you mentioned, cause additional scar tissue. So it really is just depends on, we go by imaging, see is there something large that we can we need to remove that's there? Otherwise it's fertility treatments. Um, so yeah, scar tissue is definitely a concern. Chocolate cyst. Um, uh, so right. Oh, cyst, and endometriosis cyst. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So oh, the question is about endometriosis cyst or chocolate cyst. Yes. Yeah, so those typically need to be removed unless it's something super tiny. All right. But over time, tiny becomes not tiny. Right. So you want to make sure that most of the time surgery. Um, but it's very important that the surgery is done by a specialist because one of the concerns that a lot of fertility doctors have is that, you know, you have an endometrioma, you go in for surgery, you end up with almost no ovary remaining, and then they don't have your, any eggs for you to, you know, to retrieve or whatever. So um, it's, it's important not to let it grow to a point where there is no ovary left. Um, but it's also important, even if it's a small and medium size or, or large size, for a specialist to go in and to remove the endometrioma and try to preserve as much of the normal ovarian tissue as possible so there, there are some viable eggs. Can you take these medications after hysterectomy? So I'm assuming this is a you know the birth control pills or other medications for endometriosis. Yes, yeah, so hysterectomy is just removal of the uterus. If your ovaries are still there, you can still grow endometriosis. And so we can still put patients on these medications to help with symptoms or to, to help reduce endometriosis. All right. Um, okay, that, that was you. Yeah, so chocolate cyst is endometriosis cyst. Yeah, so that, there's no um, question about that for sure. So chocolate cyst endometriosis. Now, important to know that let's say you you have all the pain, the symptoms, we do ultrasound, it shows a chocolate, aka endometriosis cyst. Does that mean this is the only area that, of endometriosis that you have? No, that just means that's the only thing that can be seen on imaging. During laparoscopy, you can find other areas of endometriosis, okay? So if you're struggling um, to sort of figure out, should I do surgery? Should I not do surgery? The cyst is really not that big. You could have other areas of endometriosis. We could determine if you have a mess like this, right? Because on imaging, she probably has like a small endometrioma and nothing else, right? But only when we do the laparoscopy, we, we see this is stage four endometriosis. This is not mild. And we really should never just sit there and manage it, you know, with, with serial ultrasounds. Hemorrhagic cysts versus um, endometrioma. So hemorrhagic cyst is a normal, what we call physiologic or functional cyst. So that means that um, it's a cyst that comes and, go, comes and goes every month with ovulation. It's just a follicle as a result of ovulation, all right? And there's some blood in there that goes re gets reabsorbed and goes away. All right. And on imaging, sometimes you can't tell the difference between the two. So, but typically hemorrhagic cysts do not cause pain. So if you've had pain since you were 14 years old and the OBGYN does an ultrasound and they see a cyst and they're like, oh, I don't know, is this hemorrhagic? Is this endometrioma? Let's get another one in six weeks. I mean, you can do that, but the thing is, the whole point is that you're having pain. And even if the cyst is not an endometriosis cyst and it goes away, you've been having pain for the past 10 years. And that's what should drive your, you know, further investigation with laparoscopy rather than getting ultrasounds every six months waiting for this thing to go away. But definitely if you do another ultrasound, the cyst is still there, that's a sign that, uh, you know, that you need to figure out what's going on. Now we have one attendee with their hand up. What do I do with that? Or is that, oh, you're on mute. Daisy, you're muted. Sorry, I'm talking to myself here. <laughs> um, That was G Jennifer. She asked her question already. You oh, okay. That was the last one. Got it, okay. Great. 
Thank you. I think we got through all the questions. Yeah. So, I mean, the main takeaway point from this is endometriosis is extremely common. This is not a rare condition. All right. So you want to really be proactive. Um, and you know, if you are the patient, be your own advocate. Okay. Um, it, it, there's you, I mean, oh my God, I think last Friday I saw two patients and it was just, they were carbon copies of each other. It was really ridiculous. And I saw them like one at, you know, let's say 12 o'clock, one at 1230 and their stories were exactly a match. It's like, as if they decided, you know, to have the same story in the waiting area and then just came in telling the same, same story. I mean, 10 years of not having a diagnosis, going from doctors to doctors, everybody telling them this is totally normal. Um, you know, I'm having menstrual pain. Oh, it's normal. Like no one is even not, I mean, sometimes people will mention endometriosis. Oh yeah, you probably have endometriosis, not a big deal, kind of like that. But in their cases, um, no one ever even mentioned the word endometriosis. It's like, it doesn't exist. Um, they just told them, you know, I mean, period pain kind of, uh, it's normal. Everybody goes through it. You know, here's some birth control pills or take ibuprofen, you know, take, start taking ibuprofen three days before your scheduled period. So it's kind of the typical story. So, but typically, you know, if it affects your quality of life and you find yourself, um, not being able to go to work or to school, um, not being able to do your normal activities and everything that revolves around your period, that's not normal. All right. Um, so that's, that's your kind of sign that you have to go see a specialist. Um, and early diagnosis is important because you, you could have an endometriosis that progresses, right? So it may have started out mild, but now that 10 years have been spent just going around in circles, it may be now severe and now it may have affected your fertility. Uh, but maybe you're not interested in fertility and that, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't care about the progression because it spreads to other structures, right? So it's kind of like cancer. You don't die from it, but it spreads locally. So it starts out maybe at one, two spots near the uterus, and then it progresses to your colon, to your bladder, right? And these are not reproductive structures, but certainly, you know, it would be bad to have the endometriosis there. So it, it can affect you and, um, you know, surgery is very important for diagnosis, uh, but definitely in the severe disease, when it's already been so ignored and delayed, it's going to be very difficult to treat it um, by surgery, by any means. And sometimes we don't know why someone at the age of 20 has stage four endometriosis and someone at the age of 40 has stage one endometriosis. We don't know how that happened. Why? Why in this person, it it was so fast and probably from the very beginning, it was already moderate, right? And it's just progressed to severe. We don't know, but we need to, all we can do is diagnose it in time and then treat it appropriately and try to help this patient have the best quality of life they can. Uh, whatever that means, you know, for everybody is, is different. Um, but yeah, endometriosis symptoms can vary, but there's going to be some signs of it. All right. Maybe it's only infertility and nothing else, but that can, that's a sign in itself. And then again, laparoscopy, you just have to, you have to do it. You have to realize that that's part of the step. And that's, it's not, I mean, of course, every surgery is surgery, but that's why, again, you choose a specialist, right? Choose somebody who does it all the time, who's going to, you know, do the best job they can. Um, and understanding there's, of course, there's complications that can happen with every surgery, but the more experienced surgeons typically have lower complication risks and, um, not, and you will have your answer, right? And a lot of patients will say, you know, I'm so happy I did the surgery because part of it is getting your symptoms are now validated, right? You can now say, I have endometriosis. This is why I've been having all this pain. Like I'm not crazy. I'm, I don't like, I'm not attention seeking, right? I don't like to show up in the ER, you know, every 28 days. I have really bad endometriosis. 
Um, so that I think that's, you know, psychologically, that's also a big, really important part of it. Self-advocacy is such a huge part of this uh, in most cases, right? Uh, we have one yeah. question from LJ. I think this is great. Uh, is yeah. laparoscopic surgery critical operation? What is the requirement during the operation? What is uh, This is also a great one. What is the qualifications uh, the doctors need, need to have to do yeah. such operation? Yes. So. Great question. All right. So because, you know, one of the things, internet... You know, it's good and it's bad, right? You go online, everyone is a specialist, right? So how do you know? So you have to ask very specific questions. Um, how many surgeries do you do per week, all right? Don't, don't say like a year because that's kind of too long of a time. Um, it's like driving. I mean, if you're only driving a couple times a year, you really you know, don't drive very much and you probably should not be like an Uber driver or something, right? <laughs> so you want to be doing this on a regular basis. So surgery, it has to be the majority of this person's practice. So typically we say that OBGYNs, so general OBGYNs, the ones that deliver babies, they just don't have time for surgery. I mean, it's not feasible. They're in the hospital, right? Delivering babies. They can't be doing also surgery with the same extent. They're seeing patients in the office. They're seeing pregnant patients in the office. It's just not possible. So you're not going to have an OBGYN that's practicing obstetrics, an expert in, in laparoscopic endometriosis excision. It's not possible. You have to go to an expert, meaning this is a person who all they do is surgery. All right. And typically, it's going to be somebody who's fellowship trained. So someone who underwent extra training in minimally invasive surgery um, in order to, to have to sort of acquire the extra skill. Um, and then, you know, years of practice, you can take it with a grain of salt because it also, again, the, goes back to how many surgeries they've done. So, you know, when I um, was like, let's say 10 years ago, right? So I've been in practice for 15 years. Um, is it 15 years? Or more? Yeah, it's, it's about 15 years. Yeah. So when I was in practice for five years, it would, I remember I, I would get so irritated because at five years, I've already done a ton of cases because that's all I, I was doing, still surgery. From the very beginning that I started, like I finished my residency and I did a fellowship, it was all just surgery. I didn't do obstetrics at all. I didn't like switch over to doing surgery. It was all I was doing from the beginning. So after five years, I've already had a pretty good surgical experience. But when you think about five years as a doctor, like that's like, eh, you don't really have experience. So, you know, you could have this guy with a white coat, gray hair, gray mustache. I've been practicing for 30 years. And all of it, you know, automatically patients think, oh, well, this guy has much more experience than this one who's only been doing it for five years. But actually, that wasn't the case. I had much more surgical experience. I've done already many more surgeries than this guy who's been delivering babies for 30 years has when it comes to laparoscopic surgery. So it's important to ask, this was a long winded answer, but important to ask how many surgeries do you do per week? All right. And if they say, well, per week, I mean, you know, so then you're like, oh, okay. So there's some weeks, like literally two weeks go by, you have not done a single surgery that's not the person for you. You really want somebody who is operating on a regular schedule, right? So they have office hours and they have operating. That's what general surgeons do. That's what orthopedic surgeons do. That's what plastic surgeons do. This is, think of it, this is a surgical specialist. I mean, you're not going to go to a plastic surgeon who only, you know, for plastic surgery, if he only does surgery once a month, like what's he doing the rest of the time? right? Um, and then uh, risks. So all surgeries have risks, of course. So even the best in the world surgeon is going to have complications. That's definitely possible, okay? And that's the risk of undergoing surgery. But the risks, the number of complications decrease with the amount of experience, right? So again, that person who drives two times a year is more likely to get into an accident, right? Than a person who drives every day. Um, the road conditions, right? Or 
scar tissue in surgery um, or extensive endometriosis uh, with road conditions, an experienced driver knows how to avoid, you know, a collision, um, which is a, you know, a complication during surgery, right? So it's certain steps that we take. And sometimes it, if a complication happens or is happening, an experienced surger, surgeon will know how to handle it better, okay? Or maybe to how diagnose the complication after it has already happened. So all of this is very important. Uh, yes, oh my gosh, I love that. Uh, okay, so the question is, good doctors keep leaving practicing and do not take my insurance. Okay, so insurance. Excellent question, and I wish I read that question before twelve fifty nine. But no, uh, we, we have time because we started oh. a little late. So oh, okay, okay, good, good. All right, so here it, that's like uh, I I think we should do a CME on, on that topic alone if anyone's interested. But so when it comes to endometriosis, there are cash based surgeons. Okay, so they will tell you this really, you know sob story about, well, you know, I really love to help patients, but insurance companies are so bad at paying that I had no choice, but to really go out on my own and open a practice and in order for me to my practice to survive and for me to continue to provide such excellent surgical care, I have to only take cash. Oh, and by the way, you know, I only can do it for $50,000 or more, don't go to that doctor, okay? Just think about the ethics of it all. Somebody who's going to charge, again, endometriosis patients, they have pain. This is not plastic surgery, all right? This is not like, oh, I look terrible. I need to, you know, fix my face and I want to do this. And even though, you know, I think cosmetically people, it can make people depressed, right? Um, to have some cosmetic issue that they want to fix. But pelvic pain prevents people from functioning on everyday basis. So it's not about, you know, not looking your best or how you want to look. It's about just functioning. It can affect relationships. It affects fertility. For someone to charge a patient 50000 or 75000 or $100,000, it's just wrong. All right? It's wrong. And it, and any doctor who does it and gives you some crazy excuse, don't go to them, all right? Because they're just trying to make money. They just want to make money and they're taking advantage. I heard a patient tell me that a doctor or, or the practice, I guess, the way they were marketing is they were saying, oh, it's an investment in your health. So, you know, we, we can help you um, connect you with the bank, you know, you can mortgage your house. I mean, it, it's just nuts. It's ridiculous how bad these things can get. And there are doctors in this area that do it. There are doctors in New York City that's like, you know, very fashionable, um, especially in New York, you know, to take cash, that means for some reason you're better. Um, no, this is a medical condition and you will find a specialist that takes insurance, all right? Now, yes, it's true that you're not gonna find a practice that takes every single insurance, all right? And the reason for that is because you're right, it's a business and sometimes the insurances pay so badly, all right, that we just don't get paid at all, right? Or, or the payment is so low, right? We just cannot afford to take this insurance. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think you know, a whole, we, we, whole webinar on that. <laughs> I know. So, so yeah. So, I mean, you have to, and, and we have, what we have is patient relation coordinators. We call them PRCs. And that's really the, the first contact that the patient has when they call our practice as a new, new patient. All right. And the PRCs can look at, at, at your insurance. So, you know, we take all the kind of your private insurances, Cigna, United, Aetna. Um, we, we are in that work in some locations for, for Blue Cross Blue Shield. So it, it just depends on what specific plan you have, because with, even within, let's say, Cigna plan, there's some weird plans that like no one takes. Okay. So that's why, you know, we have 
experts in, in our practice that can look at your plan and figure out, um, and also figure out your out of pocket. I mean, you might have insurance and you're like, okay, I have insurance. And then they can let you know what is your out of pocket. And then you find out that you just have terrible insurance, right? And that, you know, you have very high out of pocket costs. And a lot of times we can work with you. Um, a lot of times, you know, when patients come to us and it's near open enrollment, we can help them select a better plan. Um, so there's, I mean, the insurance companies, you know, again, they're in, in business of making money too. And they make a ton of money, right? Insurance companies, United, Cigna, all these companies make a ton of money. So they're not, uh, you know, if you have high insurance premiums, you're going to have better insurance. You know, hopefully most of you guys are insured through your employer. So your plans are going to be decent, but we, we definitely go through your insurance. We don't, what's called balance bill your patient, the patients, meaning that let's say, um, uh, you know, I bill the insurance will use the $50,000, like the cash, but I don't bill you. I bill the insurance $50,000. They're not going to pay me fifty thousand. They'll pay whatever is in the in their in the contract. So they'll pay, let's say, a thousand. I'm not going to then turn around and bill you forty nine thousand like a lot of the other cash based doctors do. So they'll say, okay, well we'll take you know we'll take what the insurance pays, but then you may have to pay the balance. We don't balance bill you. We go by what what your contract with your insurance says, whatever your deductible is. I, or the co-insurance, we don't balance bills. So that that's very important. Um, and I think, you know, if you can't come to us, there are other specialists out there who take insurance and practice, you know, ethical medicine and not rob you, um, you know, and make you feel like you just had the best surgery in the world. Great. I think we are right there, 105. Um, and I did notice... Um, and your message, I think, yes, there was some hiccup, I believe, with Zoom, uh, the Zoom link that went out. So I'm glad that you made it. Um, but for your daughter, I we would send this um, recording to everyone who registered for it. So we'll just take that email and we'll send a recording. And Dr. D, thank you so much. I think this was very informative. And all of you here who asked great questions, um, thank you. We would repeat this this uh, webinar, I think, very soon, um, just to make sure that everyone who signed up for it could actually uh, get this info again. Um, so if, if we have any healthcare providers, if you're a nurse and you need that CEU, please make sure that you, when I send an email, that you email me um, back with the information I request. Requ we are required to submit in order to issue you a CE credit for it. Um, this is a series, like I mentioned. So we're going to be offering these usually monthly. So one thing that came up during this discussion was ovarian cysts. And we have a whole one hour presentation that we do on that as well. So just be on the lookout for our, our webinars. We'll be sending them a month uh, ahead of time. So you can put them down on your calendar. Uh, so resources you will receive from me today are Disclosure forms, evaluation form, please, please complete that evaluation form, even if you don't need a CE credits, because it really helps us better tailor these educational sessions for your, your benefits. So take a moment to complete that evaluation form. So with that said, if you need to schedule a consultation with us, I'm going to just um, put down that information in the chat box. I'll also share it in my email that I send out in the follow up. Um, so you can go ahead and schedule a consultation. Uh, one thing that I want to mention is that you don't have to wait like a month to be in our books. I know sometimes that's a question that comes up, like how long would it take to get a call to be scheduled for a consult? So we have, we can uh, really schedule you for it uh, swiftly. So yeah. And, and also, so yeah, we, we do phone consultations as well. So for patients who can't, you know, come into the office because they, you know, live too far away, or let's say they can't take time um, out of their you know, work to drive to the office, is still, we do phone consults all the time. So essentially, you know, we, again, I mentioned how useless pelvic exams are. Uh, you, you don't have to come in. Sometimes people just want to come in to kind of, you know, have more of a face-to-face -face interaction, but it's not necessary 
um, to just kind of discuss condition and then for us to make recommendations. So for sure. Yeah. Yep. So thank you so much. I'll just stay on just to give people a moment. And Dr. D, as always, you're the best. Thank you. <laughs> and <laughs> <Yes>. chat leader. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. There's a, a friend put an email there. Um, I, I got it. Yeah. I got the yeah. email address and um, okay. anything else in this? No, I don't think so. I think okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.